Do you remember that 80s toys laser tag? So growing up, I had this neighbor, you know the type, a neighbor who seemingly had everything. And aside from a pretty much complete collection of Transformers, he had laser tag. The whole setup, helmets, vests, he even had this little laser tag star base. You know, a contraption that you could set up in the middle of a room and have it shoot out random lasers in more than one direction. And you had to deactivate it by blasting its central sensor. Back then, I didn't really care that there weren't any actual laser beams that shot out of my weapon, at least the ones that I could see. But reminiscing as a grown-up, man, as fully geared kids dodging and ducking invisible lasers, we must have looked really, really silly. The Future I think it's safe to say that the future is something that we as a collective race have always shared an obsession with. What comes next? In the next 100 years? 50 years? 5? Hell, what about tomorrow? Or the day after tomorrow? And the very analog, pre-digital, and zero internet 80s were no exception, especially when it came to pop culture and technology. We had movies like Back to the Future 2 taking us to the year 2015 where the skies were riddled with flying cars and kids went around on hoverboards. And the U.S. president at the time, Ronald Reagan, announced his strategic defense initiative nicknamed the Star Wars Program. Everything that had to do with the future was almost always a hit. And so I don't think it was much of a surprise when one of the most popular toy lines of the 80s, G.I. Joe, went in on the action too when their very first wave of real American heroes featured its own little taste of what to expect in the future. A Laser Trooper Considering how far out the later years of G.I. Joe toys ended up in the 90s with stuff like Eco Warriors, Mega Marines with their moldable bio-armor <coughs> Play-Doh, Dino Hunters, and Star Brigade, it's sometimes hard to envision the very simple and traditional beginnings of the line in the 80s. Aside from a few exceptions like the all-black and mysterious Snake Eyes and the questionably superhero-y dressed Scarlet, the very first wave of G.I. Joes released in 1982 were comprised mostly of your typical green army men, with many of the traditional military branches and specialties represented. You had your ranger, communications officer, machine gunner, bazooka soldier, and, and so on. But there was one Joe that stood out both visually and in designation from the get-go, and that would be the Laser Trooper Flash. Despite wearing a pretty similar base uniform, Flash's green ensemble was broken up by very bright red padding on his chest, which I'm assuming were there to protect him from the radiation emissions needed to amplify light to produce his lasers. But whatever the reason, I just thought they looked cool. And even if to my knowledge there wasn't such a thing as an actual laser trooper in the military back then, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, there he was. Flash, the laser rifle trooper. Anyway, looking back, it was pretty obvious that Hasbro had intentions of making Flash one of the standouts of the first wave of Joes. And I have to say, all of that effort worked, at least for me. After I got my very first Joe in the Mortar Soldier short fuse, I immediately scanned the back of his card to see which Joe I needed to target for my next purchase. Okay, fine. Which Joe I needed to badger my dad to buy for me next. And my sights automatically settled on Flash. Aside from his unique appearance, he had an awesome battle pose that really called out to me. And when I read his designation, he was as good as bought. As a toy, Flash pretty much was as good as you could get. Sure, I found his choice of footwear a bit questionable with standard boots switched out with what looked more like smooth shoes. Hey, they were from the future. He was also one of the only two single-carded figures that came with an articulated visor, which, coming from a plethora of Star Wars figures, was a mind-blowing accessory. But of course, his main feature would be his weapon, the XMLR-1A laser rifle, which, while not an actual existing weapon, looked like it could exist in the real world. At least I thought so. And the fact that you could plug the rifle via cable onto his backpack, which I'm assuming was some sort of portable battery, was just icing on the cake. Anyway, despite playing the starring role in almost all my Joe battles, like most of his fellow Wave Wonders, not named Snake Eyes or Scarlet, Flash didn't really catch on as a memorable character in both cartoon and comics. In the original Sunbow series, Flash was basically a background character from the start with not a single line of dialogue in the very first animated miniseries or the ongoing show that followed. 
except for one episode wherein he surprisingly got a semi-featured role starring next to my favorite but equally underrated and ignored Joe, Airborne. I mean, what are the chances that both my favorite Joes would star in just one episode of the cartoon series and it would be the exact same one? And to add to the coolness, Flash was voiced by the legendary Frank Welker, the voice of the Decepticon leader Megatron, and Airborne was brought to life by the equally legendary Peter Cullen, the voice of Autobot leader Optimus Prime. But aside from that one amazing episode, okay fine, Operation Mind Menace is widely regarded as one of the worst episodes ever made. But whatever, I liked it. I mean, what's not to like? Airborne? Good. Flash? Good. Weaponized mental powers? Good. Regardless though, that was it for Flash and the cartoons. Given that the cartoons were meant for younger fans, the writers were under stricter guidelines wherein they couldn't show any characters dying or feature real-world weaponry. And as such, parachutes out of anything getting shot down from the sky were the norm, and bullets were replaced with wizards. What? No, wait, sorry, I meant lasers. And just like that, with everyone now sporting a laser rifle, Flash lost the one thing that made him cool and special and was instantly reduced to a regular... Joe Schmo. In the original Marvel comics, after a number of missions with the OG crew in the first few issues, Flash is also slowly phased out to make way for newer characters into the story. He gets a commendation slash promotion and a pay grade increase which essentially equates to moving over to a more administrative role. Hey, it beats peeling potatoes. Flash does get one last hurrah in the Devil's Jew series which was initially set as a continuation of the Marvel run wherein he along with fellow Joe Mainframe are captured as they attempt to make their exit after setting up a bunch of explosives inside a Cobra base. Realizing that they have no way out, they quietly accept their fate and Flash says his final last words, a serious and somber line of mission accomplished as the bombs go off. And true to his name, you could say that this laser rifle trooper would go out in a flash. And speaking of his name, while never confirmed, I wouldn't be surprised if the final nail into his proverbial coffin was the fact that his name was Flash. I mean, they might as well have just called him Batman or Superman. Hasbro probably figured that they were better off without the continued hassle of having to compete with a more established red padded character. And that was pretty much all she wrote for the OG Laser Trooper. Unlike many of his 1982 mates who got updated figures later on down the line, Flash was basically replaced by a new Laser Trooper. But before we move on to that guy, if you're enjoying what you're watching, allow me to flash before your eyes quick and easy ways for all of you to help me and my channel out big time. You know how this goes. Your comments, likes, and subs will be extremely appreciated. Or if you'd want to go the extra mile, why not try joining my channel as a member or friend of the Toy Shelf for early access to my stories and special exclusive ones as well. But whichever way you choose, I will forever be grateful for the support. So thank you. And now back to the story. In 1986, Flash's run as the sole laser trooper, in the toy line that is, came to an end with the introduction of a newer and literally shinier laser trooper, Sci-Fi. In a sea of already colorful Joes and Cobras, Sci-Fi, in his predominantly light neon green uniform, still managed to grab my attention like a shining beacon in the dark. See, in the 80s and into the early 90s, neon was king, especially when it came to clothing. Back in the day, I remember proudly going to the beach, sporting my neon hot pink Maui and Sons trunks. Come on, admit it. We all had at least one pair sporting a similar neon color. Neon was synonymous with cool and the future. I couldn't get enough of neon and apparently neither could sci-fi. But his bright neon uniform was just the tip of the iceberg as all that green was complemented by a healthy dose of shiny silver culminating in some smooth futuristic boots that looked like they were swiped from the closet of the original KISS guitarist Ace Freely, the Spaceman. And to top it all off, Sci-Fi had a very distinctive helmet that kinda made him look like Robocop. And finally there was his card art which had Sci-Fi stoically kneeling down and taking aim with his laser rifle looking to burn a precise hole into some unfortunate Cobra Trooper's skull. And so just like Flash before him, Sci-Fi went to the front page of my book of favorites. 
Unfortunately, while I would argue that he did a little bit better than his predecessor, Sci-Fi would basically suffer a similar fate as he was from far from what you would call a prominent character in both the cartoons and comics. In the cartoons, while fellow 86 wavemates like Beachhead, Leathernet, and Wetsuit were constantly featured, Sci-Fi was basically relegated to being the occasional torture bait and entertainment for a televised Cobrathon along with fellow Joe Lifeline. Oh, and there was that one specific episode though wherein he was personally handpicked by Sergeant Slaughter to accompany him on a special mission to infiltrate a sci-fi convention. Well, as silly as that sounds, you had to admit, with a uniform that could look right at home in any Star Wars movie, he was the best choice, or at least best dressed Joe for the job. One funny detail that animators added was that when Sergeant Slaughter goes into Sci-Fi's room to get him, you find Sci-Fi just chilling in bed in full uniform, including helmet, watching Transformers. Other than that lone episode though, that was pretty much it. It gets even worse in the comics where, for the life of me, I don't remember him doing anything at all. You would have to go really deep into an obscure two-issue special called G.I. Joe Future Noir, published by IDW in late 2010. This was sort of an alternate take on G.I. Joe with a very anime flavor and it featured a small unit of Joes led by an uncharacteristically juvenile and immature Duke. Comprised of the usual suspects like Scarlet, Roadblock, and newly minted Joe Helix and surprisingly, Sci-Fi. And of course, while not part of the team, Snake Eyes does show up at some point. Anyway, the key word here is alternate because these characters are completely different from the classic characters that we know. Sci-Fi in particular is no longer a laser trooper but the team's pilot and is partly metal, partly real. Half man and half machine. No, no, seriously. The guy had circuitry running across his body and ran on tank treads and at one time, a single giant wheel. But as intriguing as the premise of Future Noir sounded, it was really more of a one-off thing and was met with mixed reviews at best. Still, it was nice to see Sci-Fi, or at least a version of him, get some attention. On the toy front, Sci-Fi did flash one better as he managed to have a bunch of newer figures produced down the line. The first new Sci-Fi was released in 1991, although this time around, he was no longer a laser trooper but a directed energy expert, whatever that is. He ditched the neon, but still managed to look pretty decent. And a removable helmet is always a plus for me. So that's what he looked like. Anyway, that same figure was repainted and re-released in 1993, this time as a member of the Star Brigade with the official designation of Star Fighter Pilot. And then the final unique sci-fi figure came out a year later with the pilot designation as well. Hmm. So I guess there was basis for the future noir sci-fi after all. But fortunately, that wasn't quite the end for Sci-Fi and Flash on the action figure front. In the modern G.I. Joe revival that started with the A Real American Hero 25th Anniversary in 2007, Flash came out of the gate fairly early with a pretty decent figure. It was basically a straight-up update of his vintage toy which sadly, I don't know, didn't quite have the same charm as the original one in my opinion. Flash did manage to make one more surprise return as part of the extended toy line for the 2009 live-action G.I. Joe movie, The Rise of Cobra. But this modern Flash was more of a filler character in my opinion, with the only callback to the original figure being his name, laser rifle designation, and the red padding. Okay, okay, that would make him a nice homage. But yeah, for some reason, as nice as it was, he just didn't scream Flash to me. We had to wait a little bit longer though for a modern sci-fi as he was overlooked when the 25th anniversary came and went. And as with many of my favorites that were skipped, this moved me to make my own custom version of sci-fi, which to this day remains one of my favorites. In order to do this, I used one of those gaudy accelerator suits introduced in the Rise of Cobra movie, which surprisingly served as a nice base for my custom sci-fi. Ultimately though, his being passed over in the 25th line turned out to be a good thing since he ended up in the 30th anniversary line instead, which sported vastly superior figures. And Sci-Fi was no exception. While he was basically a straight-up faithful update to the original figure, this new version sported a hell of a lot more accessories including two removable helmets, one with the visor up and the other completely down, as in covering the entire face, making him look even more like a future space trooper. His padded vest was also removable and all his accessories, especially his laser rifle, looked more detailed. 
and in keeping up with his constantly changing designations, this sci-fi was also no longer just a laser trooper, but now an elite combat trooper, which just makes him even sound more kick-ass. And finally, we get the larger 1 12th scale classified line, wherein both sci-fi and Flash have not yet made their grand debut. But at this point, it's pretty much a given that we will be seeing them sooner rather than later. Sci-fi has been long rumored to be on the short list of upcoming Joes, but has just been pushed back for whatever reason. And Flash? Well, this year, Hasbro launched their special HasLab Dragonfly project, which to no one's surprise, successfully funded with all the extra tiers unlocked. And one of those tiers was the very obscure international Joe, Glenda. And if you take a closer look at her 3D renders, you will see a pretty familiar looking rifle that seemingly needs to be attached via special cable to a familiar looking backpack. I wonder where we've seen that weapon before. Yup, Flash is definitely on the way. But he's not the only one. You know those peeps at Hasbro just love their little Easter eggs, although this one is a little bit more obvious, as another tier featured a Joe in his Night Force duds, which basically means that the cord has been definitely ripped on the release of his classic version, hopefully by next year as well. But while we wait, you can read about his curious case over here. Or if you want other Joe stories, check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching, and I hope you come back for more.